Wow, Bailey, let's, we could just put that on repeat <laughs> and hear it again and again and again these days during the week. Welcome to All Saints Sunday, a, a day in the life of the church. I think it's always wonderful, and I noticed, uh, according to Facebook feed, uh, five years ago, I think it was on the fell on a Sunday again, um, it's such a gift when All Saints Day is actually on the Sunday. Now, I don't know if it's a gift as we lose time uh, or we gain time, I guess, uh, an extra hour. So maybe uh, you're hungering for lunch already, but um, you've had plenty of sleep, hopefully. But the life in the church, and the, in the life of the church, the All Saints Day is such a, such a high holy day. As a good Methodist, I think they would probably take my Methodist card if I didn't mention the fact that John Wesley's, one of his favorite holidays, the founder of Methodism, was All Saints Sunday. All Saints Day. John Wesley, in the Articles of Religion, wasn't exactly huge on the saints. He really could not find any real scriptural con- connotation that would to support it, but it never, never really prohibited it either. It was different than the Catholicism, and even the Anglican Church celebrated it. But for Wesley, saints were good people to model our lives after. And so in that, he saw merit and responsibility, and he saw opportunity for us. I have to ask Christopher real quick, are we still streaming live? We're still streaming live. This is the most successful we've been on live stream. And so now all my angst and anxiety of that is over, and so I can keep preaching. But but the idea and the understanding of modeling our lives after these saints is not something that's completely foreign to us. I thought of Hebrews, the passage of we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Some of you have heard me say that, that I love the little architectural detail in the, in the, around the church. It's all around us. And if you get kind of creative, it looks like the old monks in the monastery with their hoods on. I always think of that. Somebody pointed it out at our seminary that had the same architectural detail and to be reminded of the saints that we are surrounded by around. Since we're spending so much time thinking about where people are sitting, they're saints that you probably can see sitting in places that they aren't here today. But yet their spirit, through God's power, through God's grace, still remains with us. I guarantee you that any funeral that you've heard me say, participate in, if I get to do something more than just read Scripture or say a prayer that's been pre-written, I will tell you that the very best of the people that have shaped us and guided our lives continues not only to live in spirit, but through us. That the best of them that we can understand and remember is celebrated through our ongoing living. The stories, the kindness that they shared. That's an opportunity for us. And it goes without saying this year, I've been here long enough that in some capacity I now know all the saints that have died over the past year in some, some more limited capacity, but some as deep friends as well. I got to thinking about it. I was just like, some of you may not know some of these folks, and some of you know them far more, far better than I do. But I just thought about Philip Gorham. I never knew of a kinder, gentler Marine than Philip. He didn't take you long to remember that he remind you that he was a Marine, and probably with that came about a 20-minute story that you may or may not have already heard. But it was good the second time or the third time or the 50th time. He was always engaging and listened. Genevieve Stokes... (laughs) She was 103, if my memory serves me correctly. She was married to a former pastor of here, or his brother. Here, the pastor, former pastor of here. I can't remember that. I'm working off memory. Uh, Genevieve Stokes was, from what I understand, widowed at an early age, had a young family, met Judge Gentry, who was a member of College Place Church, and married him. And then he passed away, and at some point... Dr. Stokes came, and she married him. 
The classic line from Genevieve Stokes' funeral that I remember that I still laugh at every once in a while, she said she went to College Place for all of her husbands. <laughs> she thought it was a very fine church. Vashti Sugg, Ty Sugg, uh, she was the second family practitioner nurse in North Carolina. She's got huge awards. She set up a family planning opportunities and ideas and to care for people who weren't have access to medical attention in three counties in the state of North Carolina long before it was cool or vogue or even thought about in a lot of places. She was a member here. Well, that's pretty cool. Liz Whitfield, she would sit right over there with the hat on, regular and gloves still, that was just current. That wasn't like a long time ago. I remember Liz would tell some stories too. But one of the things that Liz always told me, she had taken care of her mom and her sister for many, many years. And I remember one of the lines that she said to me is she said, we always, us apples, that was her maiden name, always take care of family. And I thought about that. That's what a, a, a true art and a goal of a family is. Maybe perhaps a little bit different than what they did, but for all of us to take care of family. It's extended biological and, oh, just the human symbolism of family and the necessity to take care of one another and to see that others are taken care of. Bob Morris, oh, his many solos that you all heard, his time here, his huge bear hugs. That would feel like you were going to choke because Bob was just that kind and caring. It was funny. Bob, I can tell this, since we're real close to an election, he was a huge Bernie fan to the point of his daughter said she really wished she had re remembered it and brought a Bernie bumper sticker to put on his casket. That's just how Bob was. Oh, fun of laughter. You can hear that, that resonating. Jen Tates was working and had worked to get her CNA so she could help other people. Even when I was so tired and she would just show up oftentimes and would take over talking to people, I didn't have to say a word after she got there. And she had a smile. She was an encourager to people. We would go to Green, uh, Greensboro Urban Ministry a lot and she was there and she would serve those plates. You know I'm an introvert. I don't want to go meet strangers. And yet she was on the forefront of serving food. I was always so glad when she showed up because I knew I didn't have to serve food that night. I could just cook and pray. And Sandra Gregory, for, for many years since I've been here, she took our newsletter out to the post office until maybe two years ago or something when she ceased driving. It's so funny. I mean... She would, she would do that to us. She would show up and take the newsletter out there and we didn't ever have to think about it. But she had such a heart for people, especially people who were downtrodden and hurt. She'd bring food into the pantry. She'd, we'd talk back and forth while she was here and she really cared about people, especially those that were picked on or less fortunate. Oh, and just make her blood boil. Oh, you know, saints, I, I think of Sunday school teachers and I think of grandparents and I think of teachers in the school system that have inspired us, not because they were all preachy of a faith, because they, they, they pushed down a religion on us, that, but their kindness that they shared, that love of Jesus that many of them I've since known were, were avid, devout Christians, people of faith. Many different faiths, so if I think of my college faculty, that also shaped and cared about me. And I treasure that. Perhaps you do too. Oh, they're people, they're, they're weight people, they're bank people, they're doctors and nurses. I got in an argument one time, it was about a knockdown drag out at the hospital with a nurse. And I was the chaplain. We were standing there in the hallway at, on the fifth floor in Ardmore Tower at Baptist Hospital. Some of you have probably been there. 
Baptist is great. People talk about how huge it is. G in Baptist means go. You can get anywhere in the hospital on the G floor and on the fifth floor. You can get anywhere. It's great. I love it. It makes the Greensboro Hospital seem like a maze. But anyway, this nurse got on there and she says, I'm, I'm really proud of you because I was a chaplain that summer. She said, I'm really proud of you for, for going into ministry and to hearing God's calling in your life. And I said, well, I appreciate it. I said, and I'm really thankful for your calling and you for hearing God's call in your life to be a nurse. And she says, well, this ain't no calling. This is a profession. And I said, well, and some days mine feels like a profession, but at the other time, I think that you've got to be a good nurse. You've got to have a calling too. And it doesn't really matter what you're doing. I think part of what it takes to be a person of faith living in the world is to find that calling and to exercise it. I, I love the way Parker Palmer says it. Part of what we're called to do is to find the place where, where the world needs and our greatest love and where those two connect, and we chase it. We figure out a way to do it. I probably butchered that, but I think you got the sentiment. The interconnection between, between the profession and who we are, who God's created us to be, and the places that we can go and make a difference. Oh, regardless of where we find ourselves and what we find ourselves. And sometimes, you know, there, there are professions out there that, that are tougher, perhaps, to do than others. You know, preachers, for instance, we only work one hour a week on Sunday. And during COVID, it's only 30 minutes. I'm about out of time. But, you know, and there's some that you take home the burdens and the tasks that are before you. You worry about them, lay awake at night. And there are other times that, that it's a joy to get up and go to the office, go to work. And there are other times that you can just pick up the telephone and call somebody because you've got a little extra time and they might need a friend. Might need just a little bit of encouragement that you can give. I don't know where God's calling you, what God's calling you to do, but I do know that God's power and God's grace and God's might is at work in our lives. And that I, I think these little candles are small symbols of the power and the light of Christ alive in the world. You know, I always think of those little jack-o'-lanterns that we saw so many of last night, maybe continue to see them. You know, the poem where it talks about scrapes out all the bad parts and then carves into the pumpkin puts light into it for the world to be able to see around, to give, dark, to give light into the darkest of nights. Let your light shine. Let these saints, let other saints inspire you. And especially let Christ, Jesus, the one who God sent so that the world would know fully who God is, be our ultimate author and perfecter of our faith allow our lives to be modeled after Him and His work and His life. All glory, honor, and power be to the one who was, who is, and who is to come. Amen.